So let me um, let me start uh, two things. First of all, I'm here in my capacity as a visiting scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, where I lead our program on technology and <coughs> competition. Um, and we take tend to take a uh, dynamic view of the internet and of technology industries in general, a Schumpeterian view, if you will, uh, one in which creative destruction plays an important role. And I think if you look at the history of the internet and the history of the telecommunications uh, infrastructure recently, um, that uh, you find those phenomena being uh, very important. So the question that we ask as we look at these things is, is not what is the situation today or what, how do we think about this in static terms, but rather what's the best way to structure uh, a process uh, in order to move the ball forward to advance uh, the internet and all of the things that it provides to us over time. Uh, and the fundamental question, the fundamental policy question, I'm going to come back to some some brick and mortar, some um, more mundane issues here in a second. But, but the, at a vision level, the question is, will the future of the Internet uh, and everything that it means to us be shaped by a gover government-centric view in which people in Washington decide what we want, or will it be shaped by an individualistic uh, or entrepreneurial view in which people decide independently what they want and those desires are worked out through markets and through voluntarism and voluntary agreements. Um, so as you think about this from kind of a big picture, there are two very different futures. And as we think about information technology and the internet, uh, I think this, I think it's a very important zone. Uh, it invokes the First Amendment, it invokes our personal freedoms in a very meaningful way. Uh, and when I hear people saying, well, we just need a little more government here, a little more government there, uh, you know, I think about the Patriot Act, I think about other things um, that, you know, concern all of us uh, and about our individual liberties. And I think we need to think about it in that context. Now, with that, um, let me walk through some slides. And I, I want to lay four, uh, three, uh, what may be, let's see if we can make this work. You said push this one. By holding it down. There we go. Okay. okay. I want to I want to offer three uh, what I think are will be seen as radical propositions at least to some of the people at this table. Um, the first is that more competitors do not equate to higher consumer welfare. The second is that lower prices do not equate to higher consumer welfare. And the third is that lower profits do not equate to higher consumer welfare. And I want to offer a theoretical justification and empirical evidence for each of these propositions in the next five minutes. Oops, it went the wrong way. You've got the, <laughs> I got the magic finger. You can be my magic guy. Um, so, first of all, more competitors do not equate to higher consumer welfare. There are a lot of reasons for this, right, that there's some optimal number of competitors. It may be that one is too few. A, a monopolist will act like a monopolist. It'll set prices too high and quantities too low. So we'd always like to have markets where we've got more than one competitor. Uh, but it's also true that in markets with economies of scale or scope where they're either scale economies, declining costs on the basis of volume, or scope economies, meaning vertical uh, integration uh, creates efficiencies, wherever you have circumstances where there are economies of scale and scope, it's also the true that, true that you can have too many competitors, too many firms in the market, and that raises costs, right? And it also means that nobody in the market can earn sufficient profits in order to be successful uh, and invest going forward and coming back to this dynamic point. Now, is there any evidence that this is the case, and is there any evidence that policy affects the number of competitors in ways that are good or bad? Well, in Europe, which is kind of held up as the model for what U.S. policy could or should be by a lot of people, some of the folks up here, which is really focused on an unbundling uh, focused approach. The, let's go to the next one. The, the refereed economic literature, and I, I think it's important to kind of go to facts here and, and refereed analysis as opposed to lots of opinion, which there is lots. Um, telecommunications policy is arguably the leading um, uh, economic journal. Uh, it's um, you know, not opinionated. It's not funded by corporations. Uh, it's a uh, journal that is refereed by the leading economists in the in the world, meaning to be published there, you actually have to be reviewed and go through a, a peer review process. Um, the literature, and I'm just going to put up a couple of, of examples, but the refereed literature on the impact of unbundling uh, and efforts to uh, uh, to uh, create more, or artificially create more competition in the market, is that it has led to negative effects, not positive effects. It hasn't been good for consumers. So to quote from a study from 2011 looking at MVNOs, mobile virtual network, 
network operators, uh, free access uh, seekers and renters on mobile networks. Uh, the pull-up I have here is while, while mobile virtual network operators increase competition in mobile telecommunications industry, granting market access to MVNOs may have unwanted consequences. In particular, infrastructure investments by incumbent mobile network operators may be smaller. The results suggest that mandated provision of access is related to lower investment intensity of MNOs, those are um, mobile network operators, the people who actually make the investments and build the network. We're going to come back to what's going on in Europe right now. The long and short of it is there's very little LTE happening in Europe, and part of the reason is the unbundling and access policies that have been adopted in uh, by the U European Union. Uh, next article from Telecommunications by uh, Policy by Crandall et al. That would include Eisenach, uh, I note. Um, just to read a quick blurb from that, the result, and this is in the in the wireline space, again looking at European policies, the results show that the long run effect of copper unbundling on household broadband penetration rates is negative. So unbundling this effort to artificially create increased competition, more competitors in the marketplace, has resulted in lower broadband penetration, not higher broadband penetration. That finding is consistent with previous research, including a lot of research which has suggested that copper unbundling has slowed the development, the deployment of fiber infrastructures. Mandated unbundling of fiber networks would likely deter deployment of next generation access networks. And again, those are refereed, peer-reviewed results. Let's go now to a policymaker who's fairly important and head of um, uh, uh, the uh, telecommunications policy in the European Union, Nelly Kroos, uh, just from last month. Imagine if we gave telecom operators and investors more economies of scale. We're not talking about creating a bunch of little telephone companies now. We're talking about allowing telephone companies to merge, consolidate, and get bigger so they could plan across borders and start to innovate and develop business models on a large scale. That would mean more broadband and more choice not less. First point, more competitors did not necessarily equate to higher consumer welfare. Second point, lower prices did not equate to higher consumer welfare. See me after class if you'd like me to explain this chart. Um, I'm not going to walk through it. Um, for those of you who are familiar with uh, with um, Sherwin-Rosen and implicit uh, markets and hedonic, uh, hedonic prices and implicit markets, uh, you may recognize this as a version of that. But the bottom line is this, um, that in that markets choose the combination of quality and prices that consumers desire. Consumers express their desire for a level of quality and the uh, amount uh, that they are willing to pay for that. Consumers let us know by their price signals set through the marketplace whether they want to pay for gigabit service. It's not free. right? Are they willing to pay the difference? Are they willing to pay for a 100 megabit service? Every time I turn on my Fios TV today, I get an ad from Fios asking me to upgrade to 50 megabit service. I don't need it. Okay. I'm not paying extra for the fifth, sorry, like Verizon folks here. I'm not paying extra for the 50 megabit service. I don't have any reason I can think of, and I use a lot of bandwidth, that I need the 50 megabit service. Consumers choose the combination of prices and quality that optimize their needs. If you force prices below the optimal level, what do you get? You get quality below the optimal level because there is no free lunch. Right? If you say to providers, you've got to charge less, they've got an answer. I'm going to provide less. Right? So let's move to the next slide, and this is uh, from a recent HSBC report. While Americans may pay more for their services, they have access, and let's leave aside the debate. You, you can look at these price statistics. You're comparing apples and oranges. It is a heck of a job to come up with direct comparisons. At the end of the day, I think U.S. prices are about the same as U.S. Price, as prices around the world, but you've got to look at a whole lot of things in order to sort that out. Let's assume for a second that U.S. prices are a little higher for some things anyway. While Americans may pay more for their services, they have access to an increasingly superior platform. U.S. prices might be higher, but this doesn't necessarily indicate that consumers there receive worse value for their money. And meanwhile, the American economy benefits from having a lead in terms of the other advantages of world-beating telecoms. This is a European report from HSBC talking about the increasing extent to which European telco operators, both wireline and wireless, are falling behind the U.S. Third, lower profits do not equate to, if we can go to the next one, do not equate to higher consumer welfare. This is a chart some of you may have seen me use before. How does dynamic competition work? 
Dynamic competition works when a whole bunch of people belly up to the bar and put down some cash in an effort to create a better mousetrap. They invest. Right? They do that with the idea of innovating. They do that in order to create something better. And what's their purpose in doing that? It's to create a differentiated product. What is innovation? It's product differentiation over time. What's an iPhone? Right? An iPhone is a different kind of cell phone that got better. It was better than the one before. It's different from the, draw the um, flip phones that went before it, right? from, what, from the Palm. Right? It's different. It's better than. They innovated, they differentiated their product. Why did they do that? They did that in hopes, in hopes of earning a profit on a very risky investment. And when they do earn a profit on a very risky investment, guess what they do? They can go out and do it again. Or other people will go out and do it again because they've seen that people who took that risk made a profit. Now when you look at the guys who win the lottery, because that's what it is, a thousand guys started out saying, I can make a better one of these dudes. Right? There were a lot of people in that game. Almost all of them lost. That money went down the tube. Who decides to go into the game? People who think the expected value of that investment is positive, knowing that it's risky, knowing that 99 out of 100 lose. So when you look at the winner, what's he doing? He's making a little money. Why is he making a little money? Because the other 99 guys lost. But if the expected value of going into the game isn't positive, nobody plays. <clears throat> Next chart. Uh, Europe's, this is from Bernstein just earlier this month, another analyst firm. Europe's telecom infrastructure has fallen behind that of other countries. Infrastructure investment has been flat to falling, and global investors' willingness to invest in the European telecom market has lagged behind the broader European market and behind the telecom sector in other regions. The causes of this lag are only partially explained by poor macroeconomic environment and restrictive labor law. They are mostly explained by poor and backwards-looking regulation. The ladder of investment theory, which is the underlying premise of all of the unbundling regulation that's been uh, implemented in the European Union and was briefly and catastrophically implemented here in the United States. The fundamental premise of all of that uh, regulation was the ladder of investment theory uh, as Bernstein, and this is all of the literature agrees on this, including the author of the investment ladder of investment theory, the ladder of investment theory that argued that unbundlers given an economic foothold would eventually build their own networks has been roundly disproven. So the point being that if you don't, if you, if you pr put on open access, you prevent people who innovate from earning a reasonable profit, what do they stop doing? They stop investing. <clears throat> this is a chart showing wireless uh, CapEx in the U.S. versus wireless CapEx in Europe over the last eight years or so from Goldman Sachs. This is what happens when you overregulate the wireless se sector. You get no LTE rollout. There is virtually no LTE rollout in, Aust in, in, in Europe and Austria. They have 272 LTE subscribers. Um, and in most of Europe, no LTE at all. Germany has just recently got some spectrum in the market and is beginning to roll out. But if you look at CapEx in Europe versus the U.S. over the past eight years, you see that in, in the United States market, we have invested at a very rapid pace elsewhere, not so much. Let's come back to Nelly Kroos, the head of telecom policy in the European Union. We have some decisions coming up. This is from late last year. We'd better get it right for the sake of our competitive future. Other places in the world have taken these decisions. They were pressing ahead with high-speed internet, pouring massive investments into networks. This year alone, China is installing 35 million fiber connections. Japan already has over 20 million. In the U.S., high-speed networks now pass more than 80 percent of homes, a figure that quadrupled in three years. What happened to U.S. failure? I thought we were 22nd in the world, not according to the head of telecommunications policy in Europe. And going to the last slide here, once Europe led the world in wireless communication, this is Nelly Kroos again, now we have fallen behind. Europe needs to regain that lead. I want it, we all want it, but our networks face enormous exponential pressure. Contrast that with the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission. The U.S. has regained global leadership, particularly in mobile. The U.S. leads the world in 3G subscribers by a wide margin, and we are leading the world in deploying 4G broadband at scale. The U.S. is not failing when it comes to broadband. The U.S. is succeeding, and the U.S. is succeeding is because it's adopted market-oriented policies that have, in, that have incentivized innovation, that have incentivized uh, investment, that have allowed the dynamic Internet to uh, take place. What we ought to be doing is not in going back to a regulatory regime which has failed everywhere it's been put in place around the world. Instead, we ought to be going forward with the approach that we've taken and following FTC Commissioner jo Josh Wright's uh, suggestion from earlier this week, which is to allow antitrust policy rather than regulation to govern uh, the uh, infrastructure as well as the rest of the Internet ecosystem.